Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at Lions Hall, Canisius College, Buffalo, New York. It is the 7th of May, 2008, approximately 1 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Full, full name is James Stephen Zuccarelli, Stephen without the PH, EV. Date of birth is December 6, 1946, which happens to be the Feast of St. Nicholas. And uh, place of birth is Buffalo, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I've always been uh, educated in the religious world. Uh, I went uh, nine years with the Franciscan nuns in, in uh, grammar school, including kindergarten. And then I went four years with the Christian Brothers at St. Joseph's Collegiate Institute. And then I finished it off uh, at Canisius College with the Jesuits. Uh, and after uh, I got my uh, diploma on one end of the stage at Client Ann's, I got my gold bars at the other end of the stage as an uh, officer of Marines. So you you went in, did you go in the ROTC program here? Or the Marines, no. The, or the ROTC program is Army. Is, is Army. The Marine Corps uh, then, as they do now, has what is called PLC. And that stands for P Platoon Leaders Class. It's the equivalent of the Army ROTC, or the Air Force ROTC. Uh, kind of a unique program. Uh, I discovered it by error, but uh, uh, it, it has the exact same intent as the Army ROTC. That is to, once you get your, your baccalaureate degree, you also get commissioned. Okay. And when did you receive that commission? On the 8th of June, 1968. Okay. Um, so after you received that, what was your assignment? Well, well why, why don't we go back to, could you explain a little bit more about the program and how it worked and, and sure. when you... Sure. When I, when I say I discovered it by classes. error, it was uh, uh, certain things in my life, I, I, and I, I say this with all humility, uh, one of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump because of so many things that, that happened to him without him engineering it. And so many things have happened to me in my life without me uh, uh, choreographing it uh, that I find it to be quite interesting. In fact, one of my philosophies in life is life is full of irony, uh, ironies. But when I was uh, when I was at, at St. Joe's and into my Canisius College years, I was dating a girl, and. Uh, you know, I was infatuated, and I figured this was the love of my life. And and uh, one day she said to me, uh, as I was a sophomore, about this time, about this month of 1966, she says, I want to date someone else. We've been going together for like four years. And I said, I can't lose you. And she s insisted on, let's date somebody else. And I said to her, if you, I can still remember where we were parked, as a matter of fact. I says, if you don't date me anymore, if we break up, I'm going to, I'm going to. And I started stumbling. I said, I'm going to quit college, join the Marine Corps, go to Vietnam and get killed. Uh, and it just like came out of my mouth rapid fire like. And well, she broke up with me and I, I'm a man of my word. Uh, I, my end of my sophomore year at Canisius, 66, I drove down to the uh, military, uh, the Armed Forces Recruiter, which is, was at the, uh, which is now the city campus of Erie Community College. It was the old post office. I walked in the Marine Corps uh, uh, office, recruiter's office, and I says, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. Now, this is 66. The, the war was going on. It was escalating. They probably needed bodies. And this is one of the things where I'm a firm believer that there is a good Lord, that someone is up there looking for me looking after me and everybody else on this planet. Whereas the recruiter, I must have said I'm, you know, two years at Canisius College, that must have rang a bell because he walked me into the officer candidate uh, room where there was a Marine captain. Young guy, I'll never forget, I can still see him. I can still see the his face in my mind. This is, go, this is what, 40, 42 years ago? 
And I said to him, uh, you want to join the Marine Corps? Yes, good, really good. You know, I want to be a Marine. I said, yes, sir, I want to be a Marine. Who in your family was a Marine? Never. I'll be the first one. Do you think you can make it? Yes, sir. Why you join the Marine Corps? You know, patriotism, love of country, want to be the best? I says, no, sir, I broke up with a girl. <laughs> and I'll never forget what he did. We were about this far apart. He left his desk, came across to me, grabbed me by the shirt, lifted me out of the chair, threw me against the wall, and I can't use the words he used because we're on tape, but says, I will not allow you to throw away your education over some girl. He says, you will not do that. The most important thing, the most precious thing in your life is getting your education, getting your degree. Screw the girl, but he didn't say screw. And, he, and I was sitting there absolutely petrified. And he was literally lifting me up. I felt like he was lifting me up. But he had me pinned against the wall. Then he threw me back in the chair. He says, now, you listen to me? And I said, yes, sir. Now I'm going to sign you up for the PLC program. And we're going to get you as a, a second lieutenant once you get that degree from Canisius. And I, I signed. That was June 6, 1966, D-Day, 1966. I signed on the dotted line. He says, now you're in a platoon leader's class. Go get your junior year and your senior year in Canisius. Seeing you two years. Unbelievable. And I was ready to give everything up. <clears throat> save my, he literally saved my career, my life, where I was going. But as another one of those little things where God inter intervenes, you know, he kind of mm -hmm. like, we have a lot of free will in our life, but he intervened at that moment and had that man there. As opposed to that man getting me as a quota for the day, he got me as a quota for two years from now. Came back to Canisius, uh, uh, did my junior year, did my senior year. Now you didn't take, have to take any... No, but what, what the, as opposed to ROTC, mm -hmm. what I had to do was I had to go in between my junior and senior year, I had to go to Quantico, Virginia for 10 weeks. Was that a basic training? Officer candidate basic training. I'll never forget this. Certain things I'll never forget. 67 men went into my company. Ten weeks later, 28 graduated. And I'll never forget, one of the guys that went through me was a Canisius College colleague of, me, of mine, classmate, I should say. He was one of those that didn't make it. And I felt very bad. But it was ten weeks of, uh, it was boot camp. It was like what mm -hmm. you go through in Paris Island. Did they not make it because of academics, or did they quit, or well, what happened? Well, it a combination of that. A, you had to be physically fit. B, you had, to be, you had to pass the academics within. It was the exact same thing as Marine Corps boot camp, but an elevated level. I always have this little uh, uh, discussion with my friends that are, were enlisted Marines. So you went through Quantico. You didn't go through Paris Island or San Diego. I said, Quantico is as rough physically as it is in Paris Island. The only difference is they inject a lot of the elevated demands on you as, as, a, as a candidate, as a recruit, because you're eventually going to be an officer, so you have to know tactics, you have to know leadership, you have to have command uh, presence and all that, uh, which they expect of you from day one. So 67 went in, 28 graduated 10 weeks later. The other ones, they, they couldn't make it physically, they couldn't make it academically, academically within the program. Uh, or they just said, this is not what I want to do. So, and then I uh, completed my college education here at Canisius. And like I said, on June 8th, 1968, uh, the uh, graduation ceremonies were held at Kleinance because things were smaller than they are now. And uh, remember, I was in my dress whites. Marine Corps doesn't have dress whites anymore, but white, everything from white socks to white buck shoe, it was a dress white uniform. Everybody's familiar with the dress blues, but back mm -hmm. then the, the, the Marine Corps had dress whites because we were under the Naval Service. <clears throat> we did away with those probably in the 70s. And I walked on stage and I got my diploma, a Bachelor's of Science uh, in Political Science as a major. And at the end of the stage was, was uh, the officer. There was a four of us that graduated in the Marines. It was an Army officer that gave the gold bars to the ROTC uh, graduates, and it was a Marine officer that gave the gold bars to four of us Marines. And I uh, went out and, you know, afterwards went in the parking lot, and my grandmother and my mother pinned my bars on me. 
My grandmother pinned my bars on my left, and my mother pinned my gold bar on my right. And that was June 8th. And on the ironic part, I don't know how familiar you are with Title 32, Title 10. Title 32 is when you're in the Army Reserve, the Reserve Program, the National Guard Program. Title 10 is when you're active duty. All right, when you're in Title 10, you are in active duty, uh, uh, part of the military, directly under Department of Defense. Well, I graduated from college on June 8th. Uh, I was to report into Quantico on June 14th, 1968, Title 10, which means I belong to the United States Marine Corps. I'm part of them. June 14th, 1968. I'm going to fast forward. When I was in the Army National Guard and called up for the war in Iraq, I reported into uh, Camp Drum as an Army uh, National Guardsman on June 14, 2004. I went Title 10. Mm -hmm. So on June 14, 1968, I went active duty Marine Corps as a second lieutenant. On June 14, 2004, I went active duty United States Army as a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. So what is what is the math? 68 to 04, 38 years later. So it's just, I mean, it's 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 all the Forrest Gump thing. I mean, this is who could have who could have made those arrangements or, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, kind of like directed that. And then after I graduated from Canisius and went into the Marine Corps, I was gone for three years, June June fourteenth, and I came back uh, June first of nineteen seventy one. Where did you uh, begin your career? Okay, went down to Quantico, Virginia, and in Quantico, Virginia, which is the only officer candidate school and officer developmental school in the Marine Corps, as opposed to the other arm, arm, uh, other four armed services, uh, the Marines only train their officers at Quantico. And from June 14th until uh, approximately November 14th, it was. Uh, Officer training development. I was a second lieutenant then with all second lieutenants, and we were trained in, in everything from amphibious warfare to uh, leadership techniques, survival techniques, anything having to do with the military. Your standard run of the mill training that every officer gets, you know, I, uh, how to lead, how to use a radio, uh, how to read a map, uh, decision making, uh, how to, you know, fire weapons and all that. And then in, uh, in uh, November of 68, I graduated from uh, Quantico, and my orders for Vietnam was uh, December 68. In retrospect, when you got into Vietnam, do you think you were adequately trained? Absolutely, uncategorically, no. I was not. What do they say about the greatest war plan goes out the window when the first shot is fired? Mm -hmm. No. In fact, I, when I was in Vietnam and when I was in combat, I used to uh, say to myself, the Christian brothers of the Jesuits did not train me for this. I was in a constant state of uh, fear and uh, uh, horrific fear, which is, I think is one of the reasons why I survived, because I did not become complacent. Uh, the people, a lot of the men, and in this current war, a lot of the women that uh, get hurt is because complacency sets in. That's one of the things that an officer is never supposed to like, an uh, allow. An officer is supposed to always, and an NCO, a good non-commissioned officer, is always supposed to ensure that uh, you're at the uh, cutting edge, tip of the arrow of awareness where you are. You can come down when you're out of the war zone, but while you're in the war zone, you should always be uh, alert to uh, to the point where it's almost uh, not a, a typical human response, which to me is one of the reasons why we have a lot of men and women in post-traumatic stress disorder suffering from PTSD, because you can't inject yourself, you can't take a person in typical Americana suburbia, inject them into a high intensity war zone, keep them there for a year, and then bring them back without some sort of uh, 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 withdrawal techniques or, or uh, allowing the people to uh, 
to uh, immerse themselves back into society. That's one of the problems with the military is, oh, you're home, boom, you're home now, what do you do? Your mind, you're, you're not trained for that. I was not trained, I had, I suffered terribly from post-traumatic stress disorder. Didn't know it, that acronym did not exist mm -hmm. back in 71. Uh, we were dealing with, we were the first veterans uh, since the successful, now I, this is my, this is Jim Zuccarelli's philosophy, in my opinion, okay? This country, and I'm gonna hold off on the Iraq War. That's still, history still has to be written on that. But if I can simply put it in a very simplistic way where anybody can understand it, in every single war this country's been involved in since the Revolutionary War up until the war in, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, we have never lost a major conflict. We were always the victors. And I'm speaking generally here. Mm -hmm. Korea is, is a blip to that opinion. Korea, we didn't lose it, but we surely didn't win it because the communist North Korea still exists and look what they are doing today. Although we can take a look at what China is today. So, you know, the jury's still out on that war. My personal opinion is in Vietnam, and I get into a lot of disagreement with my fellow Vietnam veteran comrades and brothers, I, we lost that war. And so saying that, when I came back from that war, I was a pariah. I don't know how many times I was not asked, but told or insinuated, you know, how many children did you kill? How many babies did you kill? How many women did you kill? You know, and in fact, I even had one person say to me, too bad you weren't killed. And some of those that you killed were still alive. So I went through some really traumatic times. The VA wasn't set up for it. My father back then was, you know, uh, what, a 60 year old World War II vet. I mean, they, they, they won their war. They made the world safe for democracy. They were keeping the Soviets at bay in the Cold War. Everything was happening good. We came back uh, uh, to a very unpopular population for an unpopular war, but the thing that amazes me, and I'll never forget the person that told me this, and today I inject that into any conversation I have when it comes to the, a war, a conflict, I says in Vietnam, the United States of America equated the war with the warrior. I says, let that never happen again. No matter what you think of conflicts, and that goes from, from uh, uh, the, the, the incursion into Noriega's Panama to uh, the Persian <laughs> Gulf in the 1990s right up into Iraq and Afghanistan. However you feel about that, you have a right to feel negative, positive, or indifferent, but don't ever equate the negativeness of war with those kids going over there, the warriors, because they're doing their duty, okay? Like I did my duty, but when I came back home, I was in a closet until 1979. I didn't talk about it, I avoided conflicts, didn't join any veterans organizations, never did anything because of what it was doing. I was 24 years old. What experience? You know, they talk about life, uh, 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 to get wisdom of life, you need two things. You need intelligence and experience. You might get the intelligence because of that college across the street there. Okay, I got a baccalaureate degree in political science. I'm intelligent, all right. Where do you get the experience? You get the experience by, by stumbling in life, making decisions, scuffing up your knee, going through, uh, a, a becoming an employee for an employer, raising a family, uh, getting married and all that. Once you get that experience behind you, as well as the intelligence level behind you, you've achieved wisdom. Well, what does a 24-year-old have to know about uh, wisdom? And that was part of my experience base, mm -hmm. going through what I went through. When I got home on June 1st, 1971, my father is a wonderful man. He passed away this past December. World War II vet, U.S. Navy, aviator, very proud of his military service during the war. <clears throat> From June 1st of 1971 until Labor Day, I never left my parents' house. 
never walked out the door. And to the point where I, my parents were scared stiff. What has happened to my son? And my father, and then when my father, he literally threw me out of the house. He says, get out of the house. You're scaring your mother and I. I said, Dad, I don't know what's, I don't want to go out there. Go out there. I said, I don't want to go out there. It's an unfriendly world. And he had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't know what I was talking about. So what I did is the day that my father threw me out of the house, I walked to the local bus stop. I didn't have a car. I took a bus downtown Buffalo, got off at St. Louis Church. It was across the street from the Courier Express. And I walked down Main Street. And when I walked down Main Street, I got to Main and... Uh, the street right across from uh, City Hall, Main and Court. Made a, made a right. Woolworths was, I think, on the corner there. No, not Woolworths. It was a bank, Bank, bank of, uh, bank of bank. Buffalo, Liberty. Bank of Buffalo and Liberty Bank. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a Stuart Benson travel agent. And I walked in and I said, um, how much for a ticket to Europe? And I'll never forget what the person says. Hey, we got a deal. Uh, Icelandic Airlines, round trip ticket, $168 round trip, the ticket's good for a year. And he says, give me one. So I paid $168, I got a round trip ticket, I went home, I said to my parents, I'm going to Europe. And I put a backpack on my back, and I came back a year later to the day. 366 days because 72 was a leap year. I put a backpack on my back, flew to Europe, and I walked across the entire continent for a year. There wasn't a park bench in Europe I didn't sleep on. I made it as far east as Moscow, Leningrad, back then it was Leningrad, up to the Arctic Circle, down to Madrid, down to uh, uh, as far south as Rome. I was in East, east Berlin, East Germany, every country except Portugal. I just walked. And then when I stopped walking, I'd jump on a train. The conductor would come up, with your ticket? I don't have one. They'd throw me off at the next city. i just get on another train. And that's what I did for a year. Why I was, I, I didn't have a VA to go to. I didn't have a, a veterans uh, a assistance center to go to. Because my time in Vietnam, I was only in Vietnam uh, two months. Of the two months, seven weeks was leading the uh, combat platoon. Hey, can we go back to that? And, sure. Uh, when, when did you arrive in Vietnam? December 22nd. Mm -hmm. December 22nd, 1968. And I was wounded seven times on February 22nd, 1969. Landed in Vietnam. Here's another story. Unbelievable story. You're from Buffalo. This should ring a bell. I landed in Vietnam on uh, December 22nd, 1968. You lose your papers. And uh, they, I get off the plane. They go, okay, Lieutenant, where are you going to? I said, 26th Marine Regiment. All right, jump in the back of this three-quarter ton. So I jump in the back of the three-quarter ton, and we're just driving through the city of Dene, out to the regimental headquarters. Okay. And I get, and I have no weapon, because I haven't checked into the unit yet. And I, and I just left Buffalo, New York, just left Canisius College. You know, six months ago, seven months ago, I was in college. Now I'm in Vietnam. So I walk through the wire, and where do you always report? And you always report into the S-1 agent itself. So I asked the guard, where's the adjutant's office? Lieutenant's it's right over there. So I walked into the adjutant's office, I sit down, I was the first lieutenant there. And I says, uh, Lieutenant Zuccarelli reporting his orders, sir. And the lieutenant says, you don't have to serve me. I'm a, I'm a first lieutenant, you're a second. We're the lieutenants. So he starts checking me in. And he goes, uh, where are you from? I says, uh, East Coast. He goes, I'm from the East Coast, too. We're in the East Coast. He says, New York. He says, I'm from New York State, too. We're in New York. I said, Buffalo. He said, you got to be kidding me. I'm from Buffalo, too. I says, what part of Buffalo? He says, I grew up in Amherst. I says, I grew up in Amherst. <laughs> he says, where in Amherst? I says, Snyder. He says, I grew up in Snyder. What parish did you go to? I said, Christ the King. He says, that's my parish. <laughs> I said, what's your name? He says, Frank J. Clark. I said, oh, I'm Jim Zuccarelli. I didn't know him. Well, Frank Clark is our district attorney. Frank J. Clark's our DA. And uh, at the, in fact, I still got the paper that he signed on February tw or December 22nd. Frank J. Clark, district, who's now the district attorney for Erie County. First guy, I ever, first time I met him, I probably lived a couple blocks from him, was in Da Nang, South Vietnam. So he said to me, I'm going to do you a favor. 
It's December 22nd. We won't send you out into the field until after New Year's. I said, thanks. Appreciate that. So he sends me to, we're going to send you to an LPOP, a listening post, our observation post. So I climb up this mountain on December 24th, Christmas Eve, and there's one thing I did learn. Even though I was a second lieutenant, I didn't know crap, okay? So it was this, this Marine gunnery sergeant who probably had a thousand years of service in him. So he said, Gunny, you're in charge. He says, okay, lieutenant, just follow me. That night we got hit by an ambush team that attacked the listening post, observation post. And I could still remember the Viet Cong were running down the top of this path, this ridge line towards us. And I pulled out my 45 caliber weapon and I got into position. I squeezed the trigger and it went by banging it on the ground and it was jammed and I jumped into a bush and I got into the fetal position. I'll never forget that. My knees were on my chin. There was a big firefight going on. I got no weapon, two days in country, and I'm scared stiff. After the firefight was all over, uh, nobody got killed. I don't know about them, but nobody got killed with us. Walked down the next day, Christmas Day, and I said to Frank, don't do me any favors. So on uh, January 3rd of 1969, I got sent out to the field and I, I took over the 2nd Platoon of Delta Company, 1st Battalion, 26th Marine Regiment, the 3rd Marine Division. And I led that platoon from the 3rd of January of 1969, and by the way, the 3rd of January 1987, my son was born, so 18 years later. Uh, and uh, I think my math is right, 69, yes, 18 years later, on the same day my son was born, and I led that platoon until the 22nd of February, 1969. And every day, it was either a combat patrol or a combat an a nighttime combat an ambush. Ambush at night, patrol at day. Sometimes the patrols would last three or four days out into the jungle. Sometimes it was a one-day patrol. <coughs> Firefights just about every day. Um, well, what kind of weapon did you carry this time? Uh, I carried the 45, but I also carried an M16 or a shotgun. I didn't want to, uh, and I also did things like, you know, the traditional military, whenever you see the military, the lieutenant's always in the middle of the, of the column with the radio man behind him, you know, with the whip antenna and all that type of stuff. Because in that war, the Viet Cong really sought out four people. They was, sought out the officer, they, they sought out the uh, radio man, they sought out the man, the, the, the Marine carrying the M60 machine gun, because that gave the highest rate of power, and they usually uh, sought out the uh, platoon sergeant. They could kill or wound the, uh, the officer and the platoon sergeant if, if they could disable the, the high weight weapon, the machine gun, if they could kill a communication. You could have a whole platoon of 40 men that, for that moment in time, which all you need is a split second uh, for, for people to be uh, to be uh, uncoordinated, mm -hmm. militarily speaking, uh, you gave the enemy the advantage. So there's a lot of times I walked in the back, a lot of times uh, I walked in the front, sometimes I carry the radio. Uh, a lot of times I, I uh, help carry the, 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 uh, the uh, ammunition belt for the, the uh, machine guns, just to th throw people off. But it's funny about, I look at pictures of that war, oh my God, compared to what it is now in, in Iraq. When I was in Iraq, they felt like Iron Man walking around with all that uh, armor and, and, and protective gear. In Vietnam, 90% of the time I wore two things, uh, boots, socks rotted off you. So boots and in, in your, uh, in your uh, utility trousers, that was it. Because uh, you wore your, uh, your uh, uh, body armor, mm -hmm. which wouldn't even be considered today as body armor, but during the heat, uh, you take it off. And so a lot of times I'd be in a firefight with just bare chested and, 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 and uh, utility trousers and boots. Do you wear a helmet at all? Or? Wore a helmet. A lot of times I took the helmet off. Put, get the, that's one of the reasons for my many wounds, and I'll admit it to this day. I, I wasn't wearing a helmet, and I wasn't wearing body armor. That's why I got hit so many times. I got hit by seven grenades. I got shrapnel from my head all the way down to my ass. You know, in my chest and my arms, all that kind of stuff. But I was 
scared stiff every moment I was there, petrified. It was a controlled fear, uh, very alert, always looking at the ground, always aware of what was going around. And uh, I was very successful after that, after I did get out of the Marine Corps, come back home, and went through that trauma of, of sequestering myself in my parents' house for three months and then walking across Europe for a year by myself, trying to find who I was. <clears throat> I came back home, I went into the closet, and I was very successful at that uh, until 79. Didn't tell anybody I was in the Marines, didn't tell anybody I was a Vietnam veteran. If anybody asked, said no, you know. And nobody really asked back then, because the war ended and for the U.S. in 73, ended for the South Vietnamese in 75, and April 30th when, when Saigon was overrun. <clears throat> and uh, I figured that it's just like anything else in life. Uh, the way, best way to control pain is just don't even realize it's there. You know, I, I must have taken a lot of uh, uh, mental placebos every day to get through this. <clears throat> and after a while, it worked so good <coughs> that in the mid-80s, I even doubted in my own mind that I went to Vietnam. I even said, did I really do this? And that's how I got involved in the Vietnam community. Uh, uh, I'm going to go back again. How, how were you wounded? Were you in a firefight or an yes, ambush? Uh, or? It, was, it was February 22nd. It was a Saturday. We could do this whole interview on that one day. I'll, I can remember that day every minute of every hour of that day. But uh, one of my, the, the, the Marines in my platoon, his name was Corporal Sh Schneibel, survived Khe San, and it was his last day in Vietnam. It was the 30th day of, his, of the 13th month. He was going back home. And he was one of the guys, Lieutenant, I want to go on a patrol with you. Nope, you're not going out, damn it. Lieutenant, I want to go on an ambush. Nope, you're not going out. You're staying back doing hill security. Oh, I'm a Marine. I says, you survived Khe San, you survived 12 months in country, and I'm making a decision. You are going to do hill security for this for the last month you're here. You're just going to be, a, 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 you know, uh, on the wire. So it was his last day. So I ran up to. Uh, I said, I said, Corporal Schneider, I got to make sure you get back safely to Da Nang, which was about 20 kilometers from where we were, and about 13 miles, 12 miles. So I ran up to my. My uh, company commander, my skipper, uh, uh, Captain Moorhead was his name. I want to tell him, Lieutenant's going to be off the field and taking one of my Marines back to Da Nang to see him off safely. He wasn't there. I told his radio man, tell the skipper I'm off. So we could walk outside the wire, and just like the way you got around in those days, you saw a passing vehicle, you jumped on board. Get into Da Nang. I'm going to fast forward. Uh, he... he uh, gets on the aircraft and we're right at the tarmac, he's about ready to climb that Freedom Bird, get into that Freedom Bird and fly home, and I gave him a big bear hug, and I said, Corporal Schneibel, God bless you, you made it. Today is my second month in country, 22 December to 22 February, I've got 11 months to go, 11 months from today I'm leaving. Gave him a bear hug, gave him a Semper Fidelis, he got on the aircraft, and I start hitchhiking back to hit 190. That was my real true moment of being depressed. If I was depressed, it happened that one day. Because I got to what was called Freedom Hill, which was the USO Center in Da Nang. And it's supposed to hit jumping on another vehicle and get out into the bush. I went into the USO. And uh, everybody knows what the, um, the uh, uh, American Red Cross girls, they were called donut dollies. And I walked in and I saw these American girls, and they looked like beauty queens. They were probably 18, 19, 20-year-old American Red Cross girls. And I got a cup of coffee and a donut. And I'm sitting at this table, and I got this wave, a tsunami of depression. Oh my God, am I going to make it for 11 months? Because I had just been in combat for the last seven weeks out of eight. I said, I'm, I'm not going to survive. And uh, I just got this wave, this overwhelming feeling of depression. 
and I hate that word depression. I'd rather use melancholy mm -hmm. and sadness. But that day I was depressed. Had a cup of coffee, saw those rounded up girls for the last time, got on down, uh, not knowing that I'd see them again that night. <clears throat> Finally hitchhiked back out to Hill 190, went through the wire, and I saw this commotion all over the hill. Commotion. I walked up into the platoon, my platoon dugout, we lived in bunkers, was empty. Someone said, hey, Lieutenant, the skipper's looking for you. So I walked up there and he was standing on an ammo box with field glasses on, looking across the Coup de Song River into uh, uh, the area where uh, the Viet Cong operated freely. And he looks at me, he goes, Lieutenant, where were you? I said, sir, didn't you get the message? I took Corporal Schneibel back to Diné. He says, no, I didn't get it. As far as I'm concerned, you were UA, unauthorized absence. You abandoned your post. The hill got hit. Four Marines were killed. And if you go to the wall in Washington, D.C., their four names are all together. Four Marines were killed. And I sent your platoon out as a reaction for it to chase down the, uh, the Viet Cong. And your platoon sergeant's leading them where you should be leading them. He says, get your ass into my hooch because I'm going to take those bars away from you. I said, Captain, I can't. I got to go on an ambush tonight. He said, I'll see you in the morning. And I wasn't supposed to go on an ambush that night. It was my night off, so to speak. You go on like three nights of ambush, you take one night sleep and sleep on your cot. So I, I went down and uh, I got my right guide. And I said, ah, my ass is grass. I'm dead. He says, I said, we got to take an ambush. He says, Lieutenant, everybody's been on ambushes every night. It was no ambushes tonight. They're dead. He says, put together an ambush team. So I put together 11 guys. I was the 12th guy. And we left the wire. And uh, we walked down this path until it started, road until it started getting dark. Then I cut off into the rice, into the, uh, rice paddies. And I said, we're going to set the ambush up right here. But I, then I got this overwhelming feeling that we're being watched. Someone's watching us. And it wasn't dark enough. So I said, the VCers, they're watching us, and if they know where we are, we're going to be surprised. So I told the Marines to get up. We walked down this path, and I said, we're going to set this, set the ambush up right here. And all I remember is this dark silhouette in front of me, dark silhouette. Starting to say, Lieutenant, this is, I said, shut up, keep quiet. This is where we're setting the ambush up. Put a four-man team over there four-man team here, which will be me and three other Marines, and a four-man team behind us for our rear security. Well, that guy that told me that, I only found out back in, in 2002, was uh, uh, Corporal Alan Knight. We talk about it, I'm going to see him in a, in a couple weeks going for an, a reunion. Uh, he was going to come up to me, he was trying to tell me, this isn't a path, this is a fork, and there's two roads that's going to come right to where we are. So if they come down the wrong road, they're going to walk all over us. So it was super hot that night. It would be like 105 degrees with 100 degree uh, uh, humidity. And I took my flat jacket off, and I took my 12 grenades and put them in my helmet, took my helmet off, got on the radio, and I asked for a radio check with the hill. I, you know, I said, radio, and I, you know, here you Lima Charlie. Loud and clear. And he asked for a time check. They said 2015, which is 815. Put the 25 radio down. And I told two guys in the, in the hole, you two guys sleep for the first couple hours, and I'll stay up with the other. And all of a sudden, I looked up there. And right about where those cameras are was a path. I saw all these black silhouette with the uh, typical Vietnamese cone hat walking right there. And I had all the Claymore mines, with all the, we call them hell boxes, the things that initiate them, had them all brought to me. I was lieutenant. If anything was going to be initiated, it's going to be initiated by me. And they had like four mine, Claymore mines out there. And I grabbed all four of them, and I waited to that first one was right at the first Claymore, and I pressed them simultaneously. And it was, all I saw was all this orange and about four or five human beings just completely evaporated, for lack of a better term.
you know what a claymore mine mm -hmm. is, okay. And they were just consumed by flashes, whiteness, and the explosion <coughs> of the claymores. And every ambush that I've ever been on, it's a classic ambush. Once you set off the claymores, you all stand up, every weapon gets on automatic, you just spray the entire area in front of you, and within eight to ten seconds, it's over. Then what you go, you go tagging the bodies, and, and you usually drag them to a place, the next morning the helicopters come in, pick up the dead bodies, and they turn it over to G2, and the intelligence guys that figure out what's going on. Well, when we stood up, we started spraying the area, all of a sudden, the weapons fire from out there to us was ten times the rate of fire that we were given. And, and I go, holy shit, you know? I thought I ambushed a sapper team coming into Da Nang, which would have been maybe 12 men at the most. But it was a point element of a, a higher unit, company or battalion. So it was either the point of two or 300 men that were uh, maybe a, a 100 meters away, length of a football field. So I turned around to... Uh, I gave an order, I turned around for the guys in that hold to move back to where the other four is so that be a power of 12 and a grenade landed and went off and it hit me in the head and I went into the ground. And uh, shrapnel went into my skull, it's still there as a matter of fact. It never came out. And when I started to get up again, I found out I was all, all by myself now because the last order I gave was to pull back. Another grenade went off, and that one went into my back and took out my left lung. I didn't know it then, but it went into my back. See, no helmet, no body armor, uh, and it took my left lung out, and I went down on the ground again. Next thing I know, when I'm, next thing I'm being dragged back, and the pain of one of my Marines dragging me back to where we were was, was just phenomenally painful threw me down and there was like four of us that were really gravely wounded. And the other eight got into a wagon wheel, the old classical wagon wheel. So there was eight defending against uh, what was uh, out there. And they kept throwing grenades and I remember they would like land, these were Chinese grenades, chai, chai comps. They weren't our grenades, which I would have been killed. These were probably man-made you know, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail or something. <clears throat> Like a, a grenade would land where she is and blow up, and and I feel I feel the shrapnel going. And it got to the point where it became comical. The seventh guy said, "All right, stop this. This is crazy." I was on the radio once when a grenade went off, and I was lifted into the air, and the in the uh, the cord on the radio extended, and I'd be calling in for uh, uh, air support and artillery, and I remember. <laughs> My company commander says, we can't give you, I said, well, give me, I need illumination. I need to see what's out there. And I remember I used a term, I don't know where I got it from. I said, Skipper, it's darker than the inside of a cow's ass out here. We need light. He says, there, there can't, there's friendly aircraft in the area. And I said, what friendly aircraft? I don't see anything. Every other word out of my mouth was F. And he kept saying, Lieutenant, watch your language. <laughs> it was comical. I'm in a firefight asking for help to save us, and he's trying to keep me calm, don't use foul language. And then what we saw was Puff the Magic Dragon, the old DC-3, mm -hmm. uh, and it just orbited around us and was just laying down fire. And it started at 8.20 at night, and at 10.05 the reaction team came out. So it was for an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, my life was saved, and this is another part of Forrest Gump's ir irony, my life was saved <coughs> Certain things in life happen in a split second. Other thing in life that happens in an actual split second is like an eon goes by, a whole lifetime. Well, I remember I was at, sitting there, all I had left was one grenade, one grenade, my weapon was smashed, I had thrown the other 11, and I had my father's World War II knife with me as K-Bar. He got one as a naval aviator, because he used to fly PBYs. I had the knife in the ground and the last grenade. And I remember I looked up, and right about, again, where she is, out of this bush, jumps a uh, Viet Cong. And I 
Now, I'm going to tell you what I remember vividly. I remember looking into his eyes, and I remember him looking into my eyes. I remember him lifting his AK-47 right at me, laying there. And I remember saying to myself, and the, the, this is going to sound like melodrama, but I've lived this. I remember saying, if I pull a pin and throw the grenade, I'm going to kill myself. If I throw the knife, I don't know how to throw knives. I'm going to miss them. It's all going through my head. Next thing I know, have you ever seen a man die? He just falls into like a pile of protoplasm, just, just falls into nothingness. I look over and there's, there's Corporal Edwin J. Smolarag Jr., one of my, my Marines. He goes, Lieutenant, I got me a gook, I got me a gook, just like that. He saw the, saw the Viet Cong, shot him like that, went down, and in my mind this is all going through slow motion. Uh, 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 Smokey saved my life. He survived that night. He was wounded. He survived that night. On, on August 18th, he was killed in Vietnam. Okay? He is buried probably 150 feet from where you're sitting. He's buried right there in Forest Lawn, under an oak tree, overlooking Canisius College. He's class of 66 at Bishop Doherty. He's a Buffalo boy. He saved my life. He's, and when I, and when my daughter went to Canisius College for four years, she used to walk across the street and sit up against the tree and study by his grave, because this is the man. This is the man that saved my life. Okay, and he was killed on August 18th, buried there. So survived that night. They put me on a helicopter. Uh, I went into uh, China Beach, which that television program, China Beach, was based on the 95th Back Hospital. <clears throat> I, I, you know, the testosterone was just, was the testosterone was really flowing that night, as well as the beauty of, uh, the beauty of uh, being in, uh, 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 what do they call it when you're all screwed up? Uh, shock, beauty of shock. I walked off the helicopter into the 95th Back, and, uh, uh, they put me on a gurney, and next thing I look up, and there's two army nurses looking at me, most beautiful females I ever saw in my life. And they they cut all my things off, uh, the clothes off me, and uh, uh, next thing I know is the doc is cutting my chest open. I'm sure they gave me something, but he cut my chest open right to my lung and stuck a tube in there put me into an air-conditioned unit. I remember the Catholic priest coming and giving me the last rites. And I said, hey, Padre, I'm not going to die. He says, just, he gave me last rites. <clears throat> well, up until about three years ago, I've always attributed this to the, the, the marvels of uh, morphine. Because after the priest was gone and I'm wrapped up in this white sheet in this air-conditioned building, Quonset I had this feeling of total and complete beautiful euphoria. Never have felt that way ever in my life or since in my life. And I remember watching me lay there from about this position. I was looking down at myself. And I remember being in so much euphoria that I said, if this is what dying is, great, I'm ready. Because it was just, it was just marvelous. And then I remember coming back down into me. And I said, my God, the morphine. Is that why addicts that become drug addicts stay on that stuff? It was just unbelievable. This was February 22nd, 69. I went to a Marine Corps reunion. And this was two years ago. So that was 2000, no, yeah, 2006, Marine Corps reunion. And I met my corpsman, Doc Watts, who uh, lives in Illinois. And he was the one that came out to reaction for us. We told him a story. I said, boy, Doc, I told him a story. I says, boy, you must have really shot me up with morphine. He said, Lieutenant, I never gave you morphine. You had a sucking chest wound. You don't give morphine to people with a sucking chest wound. And another one of the corpsmen said, LT, you didn't get morphine. You got no morphine at all. I said, what was that experience I had? You know, out of body, he says, well, I don't know what it was, but you didn't get it from an artificial drug. And so I don't know if that was an actual out-of-body experience, 
I have no idea, but I'll never forget it. Make, uh, I was in the 95th Evac for a week, then I spent seven weeks in uh, U.S. Naval Hospital in Yokosuka, Japan, and then I spent my last eight months in uh, on Okinawa. I never went back to the field. I, mean, I don't know what the reason was. The reason was, I have no idea what the reason was. I was still a functioning officer. Uh, I don't know what it was. But uh, I finished off my tour on Okinawa, came back home to uh, Buffalo. Uh, and I could tell you some stories about what it was like uh, in uh, uh, coming back home, going through Oakland Alameda Airport with my uniform on, because back then, when they sent you home, they sent you home on military standby. So if you wanted to get home, have your uniform on. If you wanted to pay for the other half the ticket, you can take your uniform off. I remember walking through Alameda Air, 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 Airport in uh, Oakland, California, I think that's what it's called, and the garbage bins were packed full of uniforms. Guys were guys were thrown thrown there, taking your uniforms off, throwing them away, and buying civilian clothes. Well, I was a second lieutenant, and I had my, my uniform on. <clears throat> we get to Chicago O'Hare Airport, and again, I had cocooned myself. I was sitting there like this. Alongside me were two Army enlisted uh, soldiers, and you were a standby. And I remember the, the plane was filling up for Buffalo, New York, and they called these three young kids out, about her age. And... Uh, I remember this to this day. The kid says, the soldier alongside of me says, Lieutenant, does military standby take precedence over student standby? And I says, I have no idea, but it sounds good to me. So I walked up and I said, does military standby take precedence over student standby? And she goes, yes. And I says, well, then get those kids off the plane and put us on, for Christ's sakes. All right? And they, and they took those three college kids off, and as we're walking by them, I don't know what type of language I can use on this. But, but, you know, fuck <coughs> you, you ass baby, baby killers. And I just wanted to be left alone. And us three guys got on that aircraft, and we got on that aircraft. Everybody in that plane considered us pariah. You know, they wouldn't look us in the eye. We, they wouldn't eat. What are these kids, these college kids? You take them off, and you know, you guys are a bunch of baby killers. When I came home to Buffalo, all I wanted to do was get out of Buffalo and go back to Camp Lejeune, which I did. Finished off my active duty service at Camp Lejeune. That's when I came back on June 1st of 71, and it all began. The nightmares began. The, the three months, like I said, I had sequestered myself in my parents' house, then walked across Europe. When I came back from Europe, I was still stunned. And I remember my father used to say, my father's Canisius College, class of 39. That was Canisius College, class of 68. My father was an officer, a naval officer. I was a Marine Corps officer. We'd go out, this is after Europe, we'd go out, my father said, oh, this is my Canisius College educated Marine Corps officer's son. And I said, Dad, Dad, shut up. I don't want anybody to know that. I don't want anybody to know that at all. And I stayed in the closet until 1979 when my daughter was born. And I remember this, this epiphany happening to me on the way to the hospital after she was born. And I said, one of these days, this three-day-old child is going to ask me, what did you do during the war? And I says, I, I, I got I to gotta start getting a hold of things. And so I came out of the closet. I started admitting to people. I was in the military and the Marine Corps. And then, and then it just blossomed when they built the wall in 82. That's when I not only came out of the closet, but I threw the key away. That's when I became actively involved in the veterans community. I would not let anybody, even uh, what was that, that little island that was uh, uh, invaded in the Caribbean under the Reagan administration? Grenada. 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 I wouldn't even let, let a Grenada vet go through what we went through, or a, or a Panamanian vet, you know, when they went, or a, a, a Panama vet, not a Panamanian vet. And I got involved in the... Uh, veterans community here in Western New York, an organization that was called the Vietnam Veterans Leadership Program. They helped build the wall, the monument that's on the waterfront. They've given out scholarships. We brought in speakers like John McCain, uh, Admiral uh, Zimwalt, uh, General Westmoreland. We used to have a great, we used to run a race. 
5K race, got very involved in the, in the, in the veterans community. Now, why did you decide to go into the guard? And you had what? Uh, quite a few years in between. Seventy-one, eighty-nine. Yeah. Eighteen years. I, I. I always considered myself pa a patriot, but more than that, I have so much love for this country. When someone would say to me, when someone would ask the question, you can ask a Canadian this or a Brit this or an Italian or a Frenchman or a German, you know, what is a German? What is a Frenchman? What is a Canadian? If someone said to me, what is an American? I've always said, uh, in my mind, this is my take on it. Uh, to, what, uh, what I'm proud about my country is three things. Number one, and first and foremost, is the flag. You know, so many men have died for this flag. So many men and, men and women have died for this flag and protected this flag. Number two is our Constitution. I think it's one of the most wonderful uh, documents that's ever been drafted. Our founding fathers were geniuses. And yeah, it's been retweaked in a couple, 200 years, but it's still the basic document. And the third thing is our form of government. The form of government of checks and balances, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive. It's, it's, a, it's a form of government where no, no one man has the ability to control it on it ad nauseum. So that to me is what this country, and I always felt like this country, I owed something to this country, and I had certain talents, and I wanted to give back, and I wanted to put the uniform back on. And I couldn't get in the Marine Corps Reserve because I didn't, I failed to tell you when I, when I got out of Vietnam, I, I got out with four disabilities. Uh, I couldn't get in the Marine Corps Reserve because of my disabilities. Mm -hmm. Try to get into the Army Reserve, and I failed the physical because of my disabilities. So now that I'm out of the National Guard, I guess I can speak freely. So when I went for the National Guard interview, I begged the doc, pass me. Just let me get in. And he says, you know, because if you take a chest x-ray of me or if you, you know, check me out, you know, not 100%. So I got into the National Guard. I just wanted to serve my country again. Army National Guard. What was the Army National Guard like in 1989? The traditional one weekend a month and two weeks in the summer. <clears throat> well, look what it's become. <clears throat> well, I went up the rank, came in as a captain, I went, became a major, and was promoted lieutenant colonel. And then I'll never forget, we all assembled in, uh, in Albany uh, for what is called a tag call. The adjutant general calls in all the officers once a year or, or biannually and, and discusses the state of the state. And we're sitting there and he goes, the, uh, the tag was General McGuire, U.S. Air Force guy at the time. He goes, as, as we sit here uh, on defense, uh, Department of Defense Secretary, uh, uh, I have a senior moment, he's no longer the Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld. On Rumsfeld's desk right now, as we speak, are eight Army divisions from the National Guard. They're, they're, he's going to pick one to go relieve some of the stress of the active component that's fighting a war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And lo and behold, Rumsfeld picked the 42nd Infantry Division of New York State, and none of the other seven infantry divisions across the country, National Guard divisions. Uh, so here I am, 57 years old, lieutenant colonel, preparing for a second war, arrive in country when I'm 58, year old, at least 58 years old, and I leave when I'm 59 years old. And uh, I served in Baghdad uh, with the 42nd Infantry Division, and I, I was even older than the commanding general. And I think one of the, the cutest, if I can use that word, most humorous was there was a ceremony in Fort Drum called the Donning Ceremony when you gave up your your forest green uniform for your desert camouflage uniforms. Everybody put them on. Governor Pataki was there, the tag was there, all these generals was there. Uh, and uh, I think Schumer showed up. Schumer showed up. And uh, 
I'm sitting there, it's all over, I'm sitting on the bench, and now we're scheduled to go to Iraq in a couple weeks. And this young 19-year-old PFC female comes up to me. She goes, uh, Colonel Zuccarelli, I am so happy that I'm going to Iraq with you because I feel very safe with you. And I says, PFC, why? why? She goes, I just feel very safe that you're going, that you'll take care of me because you're older than my grandfather. <laughs> I said, you mean your father? I says, no, you're a year older than my grandfather. I'm going to stop you right here. We have to change tapes. Okay, we're going. <clears throat> well, how, well, how did you feel about General Toledo as a commanding officer? Wonderful man. And I, I'd say this without that tape running. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man, one of the most respected men. I've, I've known him. He is, he's, a, he's a soldier general. The guy is yeah, the quintessential leader. He's about as perfect as I can. I served under some really terrible officers that were supposed to be mentors and, and, and groomers and helmsmen. You know, General Tudor was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd go anywhere. I'd, uh, I'd walk on crushed glass for that guy. How did you feel about the mission of the, the 42nd over there and how they accomplished <laughs> their mission, being a guard unit? Well, I, I think that... Was it? Well, without, I, I, I can't give you particulars mm -hmm. because the division was stationed in Tikrit. Now, this is, I, might, I might get this wrong because it's been so long, uh, but the response, there was 17 or 18 provinces in, in Iraq. I think the 19th province was Kuwait, but they, we got, they mm -hmm. got them out of there in 1990s. I think there was 18 provinces in Kuwait or Iraq, the 42nd Infantry Division had a responsibility for four. I put them in my write-up, uh, Saladin, Sulaymaniyah, Tamim, and uh, Adayala, those four provinces. And basically, the division's responsibility was all-encompassing. Uh, that was seeking out and removing the enemy threat, as well as rebuilding the country, as well as winning the hearts and the mind of the populace, as well as establishing the seeds of democracy, uh, uh, retraining the, the police force, the border security, the medical, rebuilding the medical infrastructure, rebuilding the all the infrastructure within that those four provinces. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were there, Again, this is subject to uh, change because I, I'm not the subject matter expert on it. But when we were there, there was seven major support commands. You had the British in the south out of Basra. You had the Poles that were in the south, southwest. And under the Poles, you had the Italian regiment. You had the uh, Romanian regiment. And then off to the west in El Ambar province, the biggest of the 19. 18 provinces, you had the Marines. Then in the north, you had the South Koreans out of, uh, uh, I can't think of the name, Ur Erbil. Uh, and to the, to the northwest, you had the uh, 11th ACR, 11th Armored Cavalry Unit out of Mosul. And then the 3rd Infantry Division had the 4th Protection Package for Baghdad itself the embassy, the green zone, that area, and then the 42nd. So that was the Brits, the Poles, the Marines, the South Koreans, the 3rd ID, the 42nd ID, and the 11th ACR. And they all sent liaison officers, LNOs, to Baghdad, because you were dealing with two separate entities, DOS, Department of State, and DOD, Department of Defense. And I was in for the reconstruction effort uh, for the country, the entire mm -hmm. country. So I was the liaison officer for the reconstruction effort 
as well as anything else. As an example, if, if, if I was walking through the embassy and someone saw the, 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 the rainbow patch, 842nd, I got to get up to, uh, I got to get a new senior officer. I got to get up to, to crit. I would help them with the arrangements. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was kind of like a jack of all trades and master of none, so to speak. Uh, but I worked out of an agency that called, the acronym was PCO, Project and Contracting Office, which no longer exists. I think less than a year ago, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was ended, their mission ended. I think the term, I think it was 18.4 billion that Congress had allocated for the rebuilding of Iraq. We got a slice in at 18.4. <clears throat> and with General Toledo, and one of his many things that he had to do besides winning the hearts and minds, rebuilding the infrastructure, infrastructure, controlling the insurgent threat, was the reconstruction effort for everywhere from the, the, the oil wells to <coughs> Cook to uh, the dams along the Tigris, to irrigation project, to police stations, to uh, health facilities, be it hospitals or even clinics. I was down at, at helping the civilians that uh, were, were in the construction effort and helping them with these uh, efforts. And it was mostly, I wasn't the person that made the decisions that by any means, I have to make that perfectly clear, that was done in Tikrit. I was the one that kind of like, if there was a, if there was a speed bump um, developed somewhere, or if there was a minor dam uh, developing, I was the one that kind of like kept things free flowing. What uh, what any LNO? I, I had no idea what my day was going to be like. Mm -hmm. There was days that I was, and I worked alone. I was the only guy down in Baghdad uh, in the green zone and. Because I was I worked alone, I worked from like 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. just about every day. Uh, I didn't, didn't know what a Sunday was or a Monday was or whatever. <clears throat> and the, the the part that the part that I still am uncomfortable with was I lived I was billeted inside the embassy compound, but I had to walk to through the green zone for about the length of a, a kilometer six-tenths of a mile through the Green Zone. And once you left the security of the Marine Corps uh, cordon of the area around the, around the uh, embassy, for that kilometer I was on the streets of Baghdad. In the Green Zone, not the Red Zone, mm -hmm. but on the streets of Baghdad. To where I got back into a compound where I worked out. And there was, a, there was the, uh, Saddam Hussein's former Art museum, and uh, in the beginning, I was you know I it brought back the fears. As a matter of fact, when I eventually came home, and you, everybody now goes through a debriefing <coughs> as opposed to what we didn't have in Vietnam. That's one of the things that I, they noticed in me. A lot of the demons and devilish imps that I that I suffered through with Vietnam that I I very very successfully packed away so far into my subconscious, as deep into my id as possible. My tour in Iraq brought that back out. And it, it basically was from the time in the green zone when I was alone. You know, a cab would come up to you, want to give you a ride, and I thought it was a suicide bomber. It was times I'd be, and this is probably all based on paranoia, but if it's based on paranoia, it's, 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 it can control me. The time I'd be walking down the street and I'd, I'd see a building and I, I, feel, I saw like a, uh, a little flash of light. I thought it was, the, I thought it was the, the reflection of a sniper scope and, and I'm in the crosshairs and I'd get behind a tree and I'd sit there and my heart would be pounding. <clears throat> and there would be kids that would come up to me and I'd pull out my weapon to the point where after after nine months of doing this, you know, I was left alone. I never walked with a buddy, which I should have done, shame on me, but I was by myself and I never coordinated. Everybody kind of like worked different mm -hmm. now or so. Uh, once I got inside the compound again, I felt relieved. We were hit by mortars and rockets. 
the, my, my sixth day in, in, uh, in, in Baghdad, the embassy got hit by a rocket and killed three people six day, and I'm going, oh, Jesus, am I going to make it again? And, you know, so you can't, unless you have ice water flowing through your veins, or unless you, you, you're, you're of Vulcan descent, there's no way you can avoid the fears. And why I allowed the fears to remain there is because I remember the fears kept me alive in Vietnam. And so I didn't have to worry about. If I got into complacency, uh, I, 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 I feared that I would be, uh, I'd be put in an unsafe position. So I let, I let my uh, instincts just mm -hmm. rule. And what, like, the guys up in Tikrit, you, when you went out, you went out on a, uh, on, on a uh, armored convoy. You had your teams, you had your battle buddy. I was all by myself. But I survived. So I, uh, after that, I came back uh, home three weeks shy of my 59th birthday. I turned 59. I was one of the oldest guys in, in the green zone. In fact, I, I was interviewed by uh, USA Today. Uh, as being a Vietnam vet and an Iraqi vet, still in uniform. Uh, whatever happened with that interview, I have no idea. Uh, and uh, I just love serving my country. It was just, it was just, I'm so proud of serving my country. Uh, baggage, okay. baggage, uh, emotional, psychological, uh, baggage, mental. Yeah. I guess it goes with uh, anything else, you know. It's like uh, I don't care what you do in your life. You, by the time you retire, you know, if you were a garbage man, you're going to have aches and pains. If you were a, a secretary, you're going to have carpal tunnel. Something's going to happen after 30 years of doing the same thing. So one of the things that I I discovered was uh, when you do service to your country, uh, it, it isn't anything like the famous 1950 movies where everything is glorious and everything is fine and everything is a perfect world. No, you're going to have you're going to carry some things. There's some things that uh, I, I I I couldn't talk to you about Vietnam because I ended up breaking down, mm -hmm. like some of the guys that I lost. I mean, Considering all the things you went through, do you have any regrets about taking the trip? The path you absolutely took? unequivocally none. Not one. I thank God. I absolutely thank God. It's like in the mid '80s when I had doubts that I had even was it even in Vietnam. That's how much I had suppressed it. Did I was I there or did I read too many comic books? Did I dream this? Never taken a drug in my life, but I said to myself, "Is this a drug induced with not taking drugs?" Uh, fantasy <clears throat> that I had joined I'm like I joined organizations I'm a life member of AMVETS I'm a life mm -hmm. member of American Legion life member of VFW DAV Military Order of the Purple Heart Vietnam Veterans of America I joined all these organizations as a life member why not to go to all their meetings but so when that that national commander gets before a congressional subcommittee he can say, I'm speaking for 377,000 members. But I wrote, and if you go to the Vietnam Veterans of America uh, newsletter, they didn't have websites back then in the 80s. I wrote a letter to the VBA, and it was called a locator file. It was just a short thing, postcard type thing. And I put down Second Lieutenant James S. Zuccarelli, Delta Company, one. 1st Battalion, 26 Marines, Vietnam, December 68th. I said, does anybody remember me? That was it. Does anybody remember me? And I mailed that in, and I've gotten, and the next thing I know, this, I get a phone call from, from uh, uh, Doc, Doc being a Navy corpsman, Whitman, from Ames, Iowa. He calls me, he goes, I remember you. I says, Doc, he was, a, he was a corpsman for the first platoon. He says, I, I remember that firefight. I remember watching it. I remember saying, no one's going to survive this. 
Doc Whitman, uh, and Robert Whitman. And I still correspond with him. And we got together. And then he introduced me to Alan Knight, the guy that was the figure saying, we can't set up the ambush here. And I says, just shut up and do it. Who worked for the Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. He used to brief the president and the vice president on issues. He went right up the ladder. And then next thing I know, we're corresponding. This is all pre-internet. Hmm. And then in something like 1991, we all drove to Ames, Iowa for our first reunion. And uh, then I went to Washington, D.C. Then I went to, now I'm starting to meet all these people. And the, the, the most humorous thing about, one of the most humorous <laughs> was we met stories is we met in Dallas, Texas for a reunion in 2002. And the theme of the reunion, it was done by the Quezon Vets. The 26th Regiment is the regiment that was in Quezon mm -hmm. and survived the siege. I was a member of the 26th, but it was post-siege. Mm -hmm. But what the Quezon Vets did, anybody in the 26th Regiment can come to our reunion. So us guys that served in 69 came, and we kind of like clumped together. There was 12 of us from Delta 126. And like I said, the theme of the reunion was honoring our docs, our corpsmen. So we all sat at a table. I love this. I just love this story. We all sat at a table on July 4, 2002 in Dallas, Texas. It was just us Delta guys. And they said, okay, guys, you're taking, you, it's your turn to go up to get the hot dogs and the green beans, or the pork and beans and all that. So we all line up there. We, all get a, we come back, and there's two guys sitting at the table. We all had little name tags, you know. Mine says mm -hmm. James S. Zuccarelli, second lieutenant, second platoon, and all that. And it was two guys sitting at the table. Well, they're all we're all brothers. And the first thing we said is, you guys can join us. So we pulled two more seats up. Now we made it 14 of us. Well, this guy's name tag was turned over. So we're all eating, and we're saying, you know, they're both corpsmen. Oh, you guys walk on water, you corpsmen. We love you. You know, we love you to peace. This is Doc. This is Doc Whitman and and, and Doc Cahill, and, and we're all sitting there, all Delta guys, and uh, we're all talking. We're all talking. We're we're showing these guys our. I'm opening my. This is where this is where I got wounded, and and and, and uh, a couple of the guys, Wendell Wells, is lifting up his. This is where I got shot, and, and for the next hour. These two corpsmen are going, God, these are you guys are war heroes. And, oh, I, this is where I got nicked. And, and this thing, we're all talking war stories. And we're all sitting around going, God, we're really war heroes, right? So one guy walks by and he says to the, he says, hey, Doc, good to see you. And he shakes his, he reaches up to shake this guy's hand. And his name tag flips over. And it's got Donald Doc Ballard, Medal of Honor winner. And I go, Doc Baylor, you won the Medal of Honor of Vietnam. He says, yeah, I did. I said, you just listened to us for the last hour like we were all Medal of Honor winners. He says, I'd love to hear you guys talk. It was wonderful. <laughs> so we said, had lunch with a Medal of Honor winner, a uh, Navy corpsman who served with the 3rd third, uh, third Battalion of 3rd Regiment up uh, at Highway 9 coming out of Quezon to Highway 1 at... Uh, at uh, uh, Dong Ha, I think it was, or Fu Bai. And he listened to us, and he was spellbound by all our war stories. <laughs> there was a guy that was Medal of Honor. And, and, it was, and we're sitting there going, boy, did you just, did you just prick our balloon and deflate it? <laughs> but ever since then, like I went to the reunion last year, was in, uh, two years ago was in Mobile, Alabama. Last year, uh, one year was in Charleston, South Carolina. Last year it was in Washington, D.C. Uh, this year it's in Las Vegas. And every year we get together, as we get older, our war stories become more <laughs> embellished. And, and, and some of us, some of like the ladies, they go, my God, you all should be wearing those medals around here. And I says, well, you know, allow us to, you know, we're in our 60s now, okay? <laughs> Uh, allow us to enjoy our exploits, and, and we're just a band of brothers. We do anything for each other, mm -hmm. absolutely anything. I love being with these guys. I mean, I'd walk on crushed glass for these guys because we fought in an unpopular war, and we all survived. We all, 
carry baggage. We all have our little demons, but we never show it amongst ourselves. But we know it. Mm -hmm. We know it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Wonderful.